Early in 1880, in spite of a well-founded suspicion as to the advisability of perpetuating that race which has the sanction of the Lord and the disapproval of the people, Hedwig Volkbein, a Viennese woman of great strength and military beauty, lying upon a canopied bed of rich, spectacular crimson, the valance stamped with the bifurcated wings of the House of Habsburg, the feather coverlet and envelope of satin on which, in massive and tarnished gold threads, stood the Volkbein arms, gave birth, at the age of 45, to an only child, a son, seven days after her physician predicted that she would be taken. Turning upon this field, which shook to the clatter of the morning horses in the street beyond, with the gross splendour of a general saluting the flag, she named him Felix, trust him from her, and died. The child's father had gone six months previously, a victim of fever. Guido Volkbein, a Jew of Italian descent, had been both a gourmet and a dandy, never appearing in public without a ribbon of some quite unknown distinction thinging his buttonhole with a faint tread. He had been small, rotund and hotly timid, his stomach protruding slightly in an upward jutting slope that brought into prominence the buttons of his waistcoat and trousers, marking the exact centre of his body with an obstetric line seen on fruits. The inevitable arc produced by heavy rounds of burgundy, schlagsahne and beer. The autumn, binding him about as no other season with racial memories, a season of longing and of horror, he had called his weather. Then, walking in the Prater, he had been seen carrying in a, in a conspicuously clenched fist the exquisite handkerchief of yellow and black linen that cried out aloud of the ordinance of 1468, issued by one of the by a certain Pietro Barbo, demanding that, with a rope about its neck, Guido's race should run in the Corso for the amusement of the Christian poplars, while ladies of noble birth, sitting upon spines too refined for rest, arose from their seats, and, with the red-gowned cardinals and the monsignori, applauded with that cold yet hysterical abandon of a people that is at once unjust and happy, the very Pope himself shaken down from his hold on heaven with the laughter of a man who forgoes his angels that he may recapture the beast. This memory and the handkerchief that accompanied it had wrought in Guido, as certain flowers brought to a pitch of florid ecstasy no sooner attain their specific type than they fall into its decay, the sum total of what it is, the Jew. He had walked, hot, incautious and damned, his eyelids quivering over the thick eyeballs, black with the pain of a participation that four centuries later made him a victim, as he felt the echo in his own throat of that cry running the Piazza Montenara long ago, Roba Vecha, the degradation by which his people had survived. Childless at fifty-nine, Guido had prepared out of his own heart for his coming child, a heart fashioned on his own preoccupation, the remorseless homage to nobility, the genuflexion the hunted body makes from muscular contraction, going down before the impending and inaccessible as before a great heat. It had made Guido, as it was to make his son, heavy with impermissible blood. And childless he had died save for the promise that hung on the Christian belt of Hedwig. Guido had lived as all Jews do, who cut off from their people by accident or choice, find that they must inhabit a world whose constituents, being alien, force the mind to succumb to an imaginary populace. When a Jew dies on a Christian bosom, he dies impaled. Hedwig, in spite of her agony, wept upon an outcast, her body at that moment became the barrier and Guido died against that wall, troubled and alone. In life he had done everything to span the impossible gap. The saddest and most futile, futile gesture of it all had been his pretense to a barony. 
He had adopted the signs of the cross. He had said that he was an Austrian of an old, almost extinct line, producing, to uphold his story, the most amazing and inaccurate proofs. A coat of arms that he had no right to, and a list of progenitors, including their Christian names, who had never existed. When Hedwig came upon his black and yellow handkerchiefs, he had said that they were to remind him that one branch of his family had bloomed in Rome.